and I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Zinsky and also Henrietta Bandman and the Hendricks Murphy Foundation for this invitation to come give a lecture here. Um, it's really an honor for me to be back at Hendricks giving a talk where I underwent my own metamorphosis into a free-thinking adult at the hands of master sculptors, such as Dr. Rebecca Rosinski and Dr. Rod Miller. Many of the themes, as well as the art in my PowerPoint, uh, were first introduced to me while I was an undergraduate at Hendrix. In particular, Dr. Rosinski's course on curious women in ancient mythology has inspired my interest in the subversive, the alternative, and the power of intellect. And you'll likely find echoes of these themes in my talk today. So I'd like to begin with a series of questions. How did ancient authors animate rigid and stationary media, such as stone, bronze, clay, and ivory? What exactly happens when stone is made flesh, or flesh is turned to stone? What are the mechanics of mechanization? What are the dangers of creating life from inanimate materials? And what is made possible through text that is otherwise impossible in the materials of sculpture? Before going further, it may be helpful to tell you a bit about my own recent research. I have been studying the manufacture of sculptures in ancient Greece and Rome. In short, I've become interested in the realities of transforming lumps of raw materials, bronze, clay, stone, or ivory, into objects worthy of dedication to the gods, or objects of wonder, a galmata in ancient Greek. I am interested in the same sorts of questions that ripple through mythological descriptions of human-made creations, what we might call the alchemy of statue production. From the archeological record of ancient Greek and Roman sites, it is clear that sanctuaries and cityscapes were filled with representations of human figures, deities, animals, and mythological beasts. They were carved from stone, forged in bronze, painted with fantastical colors. Sometimes they were even bathed or dressed up in elaborate textiles. If one imagines living in a world filled with likenesses of humans and beasts, walking around among inanimate representations of mortal and fantastical beings, I think it's easy by extension to imagine an ancient fantasy of wanting these statues to come to life. Inscriptions from ancient statues allow us obliquely to begin to approach the topic of statues animated through and in text. The Greek epigram is a literary tradition with its origins in inscriptions on sacred offerings and grave monuments. The epigram strives to bring the subject of the statue to life, sometimes even bringing them back from the dead to speak momentarily to the viewer, as we see in this example honoring a young woman who died before marriage. And so the inscription is um, on the base of her statue here, and it reads, Tomb of Frasicleia, maiden is how I shall always be called. Instead of a marriage from the gods, I have attained this name. Aristion of Paros sculpted me. Now by the Hellenistic period, these inscribed poems become recorded in catalogs and shared between wealthy patrons and libraries. In addition, Hellenistic poets pin epigrams that never actually exist on stone monuments. In particular, a famous statue of a cow by the classical sculptor Myron becomes a popular subject as with this light-hearted example of a hypothetical inscription from the statue base of Myron's cow. No, <laughs> Myron did not sculpt me, he lied. He drove me from my herd mid-lunch. Now to the stone pedestal, I stay to <laughs> In certain instances, the two modes of recording and memorializing a living subject through either text or visual material are at odds. This tension between a physical sculpture and represent, representation through text is present at the start of a victory ode by the Greek poet Pindar, who seems to favor the medium of poetry because it will spread further and last longer. Pindar writes, I am not a sculptor so as to fashion stationary statues that stand on their same base. Rather, on board every ship and in every boat, sweet song, go forth from Egina and spread the news. Pindar's attitude is echoed thousands of years later by William Shakespeare. Not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. 
Pindar, who was commissioned to write poems in honor of victorious athletes, was keenly aware of the friction between text and image. Throughout his career, Pindar competed against ancient sculptors for commissions from athletes who would commemorate their victories either with a statue or the performance of a personalized poem. Pindar would suggest that the ways in which text can spread and outlast generations allow for possibilities otherwise denied by the physical qualities of statues. Along similar lines, my presentation today aims to convince you that the medium of literature allows for the artist, meaning here the author, to stretch the form and function of sculpture to the realm of the supernatural, to imbue the statue with life and emotion, to transform a human-made object into a character in the narrative. And when done successfully, the subject of the sculpture comes to life through text. The living sculpture leaps off the lips of the poet or springs from the surface of the written word. The following presentation will examine, in four sections, how ancient Greek and Roman authors describe manufactured likenesses coming to life. First, I will introduce the Greek god Hephaestus, or Vulcan in Roman mythology, and Daedalus, the two master craftsmen of Greek and Roman mythology. Next, we will examine two living creations of Hephaestus in detail, the curious Pandora, who is made of clay, and the monstrous bronze robot named Talos. The third section considers Alcestis from Euripides' play by the same name. Because of a prophecy, Alcestis is nearly turned to stone, or perhaps is turned to stone, and revived. The final section will examine the myth of the sculptor Pygmalion and the wife he creates for himself from ivory. The ancient narrative of the animation of a statue requires a famili familiarity on the part of the author with the materials and process of manufacture. Notably, the descriptions that I present today are rooted in the physical world. In the four examples, we find an emphasis on the tools, the raw materials, and the tactile qualities of manufacture, hands, fingers, touch. The source materials of Talos and Pandora, bronze and clay, are intrinsic to their destructive qualities and their respective downfalls. The likeness of Alcestis which Admetus proposes to carve from stone, will serve as a cold and heavy bed felt. The ivory from which Pygmalion carves an ideal woman features the physical qualities of warm and smooth skin. The four examples of living sculptures selected today are well known and well studied by modern scholars. However, a consideration of ancient materials and sculptures alongside these famous texts sheds further light on our understanding of the myths. Two mythological figures serve as paradigms for craftsmen capable of creating a moving, living, breathing statue. Hephaestus, the Olympian god, and Daedalus, the superhuman craftsman from Crete, um, are the sculptors par excellence in Greek and Roman mythology. They both appear in the earliest form of the Greek language. From the Minoan Palace of Knossos on Crete, preserved linear B tablets preserve uh, variations on their names. Hephaestus and Daedalus are present also in the Iliad and Odyssey of Homer. Uh, Hephaestus famously forges the armor of the Greek hero Achilles in the Iliad and is cuckolded by his wife Aphrodite in the Odyssey. In the Iliad, Homer uses a variation of the name Daedalus, the adjective Daedala, to describe objects that are finely wrought. Beginning with Homeric texts, the two craftsmen are interrelated. Daedalus occasionally becomes relegated to a role that is supplementary to that of Hephaestus. The pair illustrate the potential ways of bringing art to life. The first would be manufactured through physical strength, which is often expressed through an emphasis on hands, and the second would be manufactured through mental skill often described as cunning or engineering. At times, the two figures demonstrate these two processes independently. Hephaestus has a tendency to create with his hands, and Daedalus has a tendency to create with his mind. And from the start, descriptions of Hephaestus creating works of art place an emphasis on the materiality of the process, 
as in the following lines from the Iliad, which occur, occur shortly before he forges the legendary armor of the Greek warrior Achilles. So Hephaestus spoke and rose from the anvil, a huge uh, panting bulk, limping along, but beneath him his slender legs moved nimbly. The bellows he set away from the fire and gathered all the tools with which, which he worked into a silver chest. And with a sponge he wiped his face and his hands and his mighty neck and shaggy breast and put on a tunic and grasped a stout staff and went out limping. And there moved swiftly to support their lord handmaids made of gold in the semblance of living girls. In them is understanding in their minds and in them speech and strength, and they know cunning handiwork by a gift of the immortal gods. They busily move to support their lord. So here we are told about Hephaestus's anvil, his bellows and fire, as well as his silver toolbox. A few lines down, we are told more that he set alight 20 bellows and melting vats, which pushed out a tremendous heat. He started mixing metals, such as bronze, tin, gold, and silver. We can almost feel the heat, smell the noxious fumes of metallurgy, and hear the great anvil and hammer. The description prompts us to recognize the god's tools as part of his identity, which is similar to the way other objects are associated with roles and activities of other Olympian deities, such as Artemis's hunting bow or Apollo's lyre. Hephaestus is a god of craft, and he surrounds himself with the objects of a craftsman's workshop. The passage also makes plain the physical qualities of his body. He is a god who works with his hands. He uses a sponge to wipe the sweat off of his face, his neck, his hairy chest. We're even presented with the nature of his physical handicap. He has slim legs underneath his hulking torso that cause him to walk with a limp. The preoccupation with the physicality of the god, his tools and materials, converges in a description of the god's handicap, or lame legs, and his assistants. Here, the, god, um, the god's creations become an extension of his physical qualities. The servants he has crafted to help him in his lofty blacksmithing, these golden maidens, were underneath and around him, just like his slim legs. And the verb, roomai, which I've highlighted here for you, meaning to move with speed, to rush, or to flow, it even has the sound of whirring built in, is the verb used for both his legs and these servants. Now, by contrast, Daedalus, uh, descriptions of Daedalus in the act of making often emphasize his intellect as a primary tool. Data, Daedalus doesn't necessarily craft with his hands, Rather, he engineers with his minds. <clears throat> his creations require cunning or intellect, and through this process, the same objects appear to nearly be living creatures themselves. In the carving of his statues, we are told by Diodorus Siculus, Daedalus so far excelled all other men that later generations invented the story about him, that his statues, the statues of his making, were quite like their living models. They could see and walk, and in a word, preserved so well the characteristics of the entire body that the beholder thought that the image made by him was being endowed with life. Daedalus has the superhuman ability to work through complex problems that would fall under the modern fields of physics, mathematics, robotics, and engineering. Perhaps you already know the myth that tells us Daedalus created the labyrinth at the palace of Minos on Crete to contain the Minotaur or the myth that he crafted a set of wings for himself and his son, Icarus, to fly from Crete. It is clear that the labyrinth is a creation of the mind, which serves to trick, confuse, and outsmart those inside. Similarly, the wings he creates out of feathers and wax require that the user maintain a sane, a sane mind. So again, from Diodorus Siculus, we're told that Daedalus fashioned with amazing ingenuity wings that were cleverly designed and marvelously fitted together with wax. And fastening these on his son's body and on his own, he spread them out for flight. As for Icarus, because of the ignorance of youth, he made his flight too far aloft and fell into the sea when the wax which held the wings together was <coughs> melted by the sun. Whereas Daedalus, by flying close to the sea and repeat, repeatedly wetting the wings, made his way in safety. 
Tragically, Daedalus's son Icarus lacks the mental prudence to use the wax-based wings effectively, and only Daedalus survives. The distinction between these two makers is muddled even in the earliest textual attestations in Book 18 of the Iliad. On the shield, furthermore, Hephaestus, the famed god of the two legs, cunningly inlaid a dancing floor like the one which uh, in Y. Knossos Daedalus fashioned of old for fair trust Ariadne. And on it, on this dancing floor, were youths dancing and maidens holding their hands on one another's wrists. They run around with cunning feet, very nimbly, as when a potter sits by his wheel that is fitted between his hands, and now again they run in rows towards each other. As Hephaestus adds a scene of dancers in a circular orchestra on Achilles' shield, he channels Daedalus' cunning and crafted engineering of physical structure, here the dancing floor. But Hephaestus remains fundamentally a craftsman who works with his hands. The young women and men da uh, dancers run around the floor grasping each other hand to wrist in the same way that a potter's hands draw up a soft clay pot on the potter's wheel. And we should have this simile in mind as we approach the first example that illustrates how Hephaestus brings inanimate materials to life. In addition to their roles as prototypes for master craftsmen, both Hephaestus and Daedalus serve as cautionary tales. Certain examples of their creations drive plots of various stories forward with a destructive wake. By their example, the creations of Hephaestus and Daedalus warn the audience of the threat of man-made objects. In the myth of the creation of Pandora, we see Hephaestus's hands-on creation of a living woman who brings about disastrous effects. From Hesiod's Works and Days, which I believe Dr. Rosinski's mythology class has read recently, <laughs> uh, we are told of Hephaestus' creation of Pandora, the first mortal woman at the instruction of Zeus. So again, Hephaestus, the famous lame one, fabricated out of earth and water, a likeness of a modest maiden by the plans of Zeus. The goddess bright-eyed Athena gave her girdle and ornaments. The graces and persuasion placed golden jewelry all around her body. The beautiful-haired seasons crowned her around with spring flowers. And Pallas Athena fitted the whole ornamentation to her body. Then into her breast, the intermediary, Hermes, set lies and guileful words and a thievish character by the plans of deep thundering Zeus. And the messenger of the gods placed a voice in her and named this woman Pandora, gift to all or gift of all. Since all those who have their mansions on Olympus had given her a gift, a woe for men who live on bread. <laughs> Though Pandora receives personality traits from other Olympian deities, Zeus is the mastermind and Hephaestus is the master maker. He models her from clay, a mix of mud and water, in the same way that a potter might mold a pot. The verb <coughs> used here, plasso, um, the verb used here, plasso, means to mold or form. It is related to our modern word, plastic, and it is used elsewhere in ancient Greek for the creation of pottery. Rather than a living statue, Hephaestus creates a living, breathing, speaking woman from clay. At the outset, Zeus designs Pandora to be a woman who tricks or deceives. In Hesiod's version of this myth, Hermes takes Pandora to the unthinking Epimetheus, the mortal, whose name means afterthought. <laughs> ignores his brother's previous warnings about gifts from the gods, and he receives Pandora into his house. In this same house, Epimetheus stores all of the miseries of the world, an epithos, meaning a large jar used for storing foods. But the woman removed the great lid from the storage jar with her hands and scattered all its contents abroad. She wrought baneful evils for human beings, and only hope remained there in its unbreakable home under the mouth of the storage jar, and did not fly off. For before that could happen, she closed the lid of the storage jar by the plans of the Aegis holder, the cloud gatherer Zeus, that countless other miseries roam among mankind. Hesiod emphasizes the active role and inherently destructive quality of Pandora in his description of her opening the jar with her hands and spreading the miseries around. 
Thus, Pandora, whose name means gift to all, gives mortals unwanted gifts. In this version of the story, Hesiod has a very specific object and specific materials in mind. The pithos jar, illustrated here with archaeologists included for scale, is a type of large clay storage jar that we have excavated from ancient pantries and many different Greek and Roman sites. These storage jars, like the one in Hesiod's version of the myth, are roughly human in scale. Sometimes we even find painted or inscribed labels telling us about the contents once held inside, such as grain or oil. Sadly, Epimetheus's storage jar was missing a label, just as P Pandora lacks any visual warning signs. Keeping the archaeological evidence of these storage jars in mind, it becomes even more clear that Hesiod was himself familiar with this type of storage jar the material qualities, and even the way these jars break. The thickness of the clay at the mouth of the pithos makes it hard to break, and the rim or mouth of the pithos jar is a common find in excavations of Greece. Hesiod drives his point home and makes plain the physical location of hope in the pithos, calling this curved crook where hope hides her unbreakable home, her erictostomos. Um, an Attic red figure amphora from the th third quarter of the fifth century neatly abbre abbreviates Hesiod's version of the myth. Here on the front, we see the birth of Pandora as she rises from the earth. She's literally born from the earth. And on the back, we see a Hephaestus figure standing beside a pythos, out of which a small woman rises. <laughs> the artist has left an ambiguity to the scene. Is the woman rising from the pithos meant to be Hope or Pandora? Or are we meant to see a conflation of both? As modern scholars have explored previously, Pandora is herself a sort of storage jar full of surprises. Though she is molded from clay in the likeness of a goddess, the process and materials of her manufacture recall the production of pottery. After she has formed, the gods decorate her exterior with beauty and gold finery and then fill her up with treachery and deceit. Although Pandora introduces miseries and evils to mortal men, she and her story contain also hope. And it is easy to imagine tiny hope getting stuck at the side of the pithos jar, up under the curve of the rim, where you might find a few unexpected pieces of grain tiny pieces of hope that subdue hunger in an otherwise empty jar. We might imagine hope stuck hiding inside Pandora at the top of her ribs, and thus it is through the pithos that Hesiod evokes pathos, pun intended. <laughs> Ancient materials, man-made objects, and even anatomy are fundamental in the myth of Talos, which forewarns the dangers of a lifelike statue. Ancient authors attribute the large living bronze Talos to Hephaestus, though others suggest Talos is the clever nephew of Daedalus. So again, we have this blurring of characters. One version of the myth explains that Hephaestus created Talos to guard Europe. Alternatively, the Greek poet Simonides explains that Talos first crushed sailors to death off the coast of the island of Sardinia and then he took up posts guarding the shores of Crete. This is where we encounter Talos in the Argonautica, a Hellenistic epic by Apollonius of Rhodes, which provides the first full account of the terror that Talos inflicts, his internal mechanics, and his death. So Apollonius of Rhodes tells us, Talos had been given to Europa by Cronus' son, who's Hephaestus, to be the island's guardian and he made three tours around Crete on his big bronze feet. Although all the rest of his body and limbs were bronze and invulnerable, beneath the tendon by his ankle was a vein carrying blood, and the thin membrane that covered that vein determined the outcome of life or death. I would argue that Talos, who we recognize as a robot by today's standards, is modeled on hollow cast bronze sculptures first developed in fifth century Greece. Such sculptures permeated cityscapes and sanctuaries throughout ancient Greece. They remained popular well into the Roman imperial period when Roman patrons continued to commission statues and Roman art connoisseurs 
looted, traded, and copied earlier bronze examples. The hollow bronze structure of Talos, the weak spot at his ankle, and his internal vein are all suggestive of the production of ancient bronze sculptures. Now, some of you may already be familiar with the production of hollow cast bronze, and a full explanation is worthy of a separate discussion. But I will note here a few key components of manufacture. You need an internal armature to support the raw materials as the prototype for the sculpture is assembled. Um, I've shown a modern example here to the right. In antiquity, this armature was made of wood or iron. You also need channels that allow for an initial wax layer to be melted out and for bubbles and air pockets of the molten bronze to be released. After the bronze is cast, the remnants of these, um, sorry, the remnants of these channels are removed and the bronze surface is polished and buffed. We can still see traces of the proverbial inner workings of the manufacture process on the bronze Piraeus Apollo. When conservators studied the interior of the bronze Apollo, they found pieces of the original iron armature. At his ankle, a small divot in the surface indicates the location of an air channel. The statue discovered at the port of ancient Athens dates roughly to the time of the Argonautica by Apollonius of Rhodes, and perhaps he had this sort of statue in mind while describing Talos. We might imagine the channel scar, which is common to find at the ankles and feet of hollow cast bronze sculptures, as the weak spot at Talos' ankle, and behind this divot, we might imagine the armature running as a central vein. The materiality of Talos and especially this divot at his ankle, becomes, a central, becomes central to his death, also from the Argonautica. As he was hefting heavy stones to prevent them from re reaching anchorage, he grazed his ankle on a sharp pointed rock, and his eye core flowed out like molten lead. Notably, the description of Talos' death offers the opportunity to imbue the bronze, hollow cast man with lifelike, yet terrifying qualities that are otherwise impossible in the material world. The rupture in this central vein that carries his ichor, or life force, allows the author to humanize the monstrous robot. So continuing in the same uh, section of the poem, not for long did he stand astride the jetting cliff, but like some enormous pine tree high in the mountains, which woodsmen had left half hewn with their sharp axes when they came back down from the forest. And during the night, it is, it is at first shaken by breezes, but then at last breaks off at the base and crashes down. So did Talos totter for a while from side to side on his tireless feet, but then at last in his weakened state fell with a tremendous crash. In his description of Talos falling like a pine tree, Apollonius of Rhodes recalls the simile used by Homer repeatedly in his Iliad for a warrior falling on the battlefield. In the Iliad, the simile evokes the sounds of a great tree falling through the brush and thundering onto the ground. Yet in the Argonautica, the description of the bronze Talos teetering on his feet and crashing to the earth suggests instead the sound of a great hollow bronze sculpture ringing out like a gong. This motif of a tragic fallen metal statue is present to varying degrees in modern depictions of monstrous metal robots. It reverberates through Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as exemplified when the beast opines, I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather thy fallen angel, whom thou drive, drive us from joy for no misdeed. And the theme is present again when the Tin Man of the 1939 film, The Wizard of Oz, croons, I could be kind of human if I only had a heart. And a similar pathos is evoked by the 1963 film version of the Argonautica, Jason and the Argonauts, that features clay animation <coughs> produced by Ray Harryhausen. Here, a series of stills shows Talos as his ichor flows out, he teeters on his ankles and falls to pieces. As an extension of Hephaestus, who has created a living bronze statue, Apollonius of Rhodes manipulates the medium of bronze sculpture itself, stretching it through textual description beyond the limitations of inanimate materials and beyond the emotion of terror. The hollow, soulless bronze talos 
ultimately evokes sympathy from his living audience. The myths of both Talos and Pandora suggest a familiarity with craft production on the part of the author and perhaps also the audience. The connection between the textual descriptions of lifelike sculptures and actual sculptures is present also in Euripides' version of the myth of Alcestis. However, the transformation itself is less tethered to materials. The myth is mentioned in earlier literary sources, but Euripides presents it fully in his play dated 438 BCE. The plot surrounds, generally speaking, Alcestis, a loyal wife whose husband is fated to die. She vows to replace her husband, Admetus, on the day when death comes calling for him. And she does follow death down to Hades, but through a somewhat convoluted route, Heracles brings Alcestis back, and the play ends with the married pair happily rejoined. Euripides' story presents superficially an inversion of the myth of Pandora. Not only is Alcestis of human birth, she is praised as being a model wife. She's devoted to the point of sacrificing herself in place of her husband. Similar to hope at the bottom of Pandora's jar, Alcestis' sacrifice is a bittersweet gift to her husband. Quite early in the play, Admetus makes his own vow that upon her death, he will reject all other women, refuse to host parties, and commission a sculpture in her image, a sort of stone replacement wife. <laughs> the tension between the living wife and the stone wife runs as a theme throughout the play. Modern scholars, such as Mary Stiber, have explored the ways in which Euripides presents Alcestis as though she is becoming her own stone funerary marker, similar to the example illustrated here. In her death, Alcestis will become the perfect wife. She will be memorialized through her selfless act and her stone funerary marker. In particular, her tomb is referenced three separate times throughout the play. One especially telling example describes also the epigram that will be carved across her grave marker. The chorus tells Admetus that they hope that someone walking a winding path past her tomb will say, this woman died in the stead of her husband, and now she is a blessed divinity. Hail Mary, and grant us your, or hail lady. <laughs> no. uh, with such words, they address her. So that's the chorus to Admetus. And it is as though Alcestis' mortality is almost written in stone. Soon enough, Admetus himself makes explicit the parallel between a living and stone Alcestis. He says, an image of you shaped by the hand of a skilled craftsman shall be laid out in my bed. I shall fall into its arms, and as I embrace it, I call your name. I shall imagine, though I have her not, that I hold my dear wife in my arms, a cold pleasure, to be sure. But thus I shall lighten my soul's heaviness. The Greek noun used here for craftsman, tectone, which still persists in our modern English word architect, suggests that the stone effigy will be skillfully made, fitted together, carefully engineered, and nearly indistinguishable from the original. In the final lines of this passage, the language used by Euripides gives the impression that he revels in this blurred distinction between living and dead, flesh and stone. Admetus declares, uh, translating literally, I expect you shall be a cold pleasure, a terpsum sicrum, but all the same, I shall lighten the heavy burden of my soul, the borrows seat case. This first line of the Greek text shown here is framed by psychron, or cold, and heavy burden, or baros, which hints at a cold, heavy stone bedmate. The alliteration of cold and soul, sorry, the alliteration of cold and soul, psychron, psychase, further encourages us to confuse Alcestis and Admetus, whose mortality remains confused throughout the plot of the play. The placement of both words at the start of their lines calls to mind the weight of a cold marble effigy, a soulless beloved, and she will be a cold joy for the living Admetus, whose own soul will be momentarily lightened by the presence of his honest wife. Euripides repeats this symmetry and codependency between the two characters just a few lines further down in the play. But now wait for me to arrive in Hades, this is Admetus speaking. 
when I die, and prepare a home where you may dwell with me. For I shall command my children here to bury me in the same coffin with you, and to lay out my body next to yours. Never, even in death, may I be parted from you. Both of their souls, eventually, will live out eternity in Hades, while their lifeless bodies lay side by side as cold, hard corpses in the earth. At the end of the play, we see another inversion of living and dead, stone and flesh. After Heracles brings Alcestis back from Hades, Admetus is hesitant to receive her because he does not believe the woman standing before him is his true wife. Admetus reaches out his hand, rather timidly, fearing that the touch will turn him to stone, similar to the way that the face of the monstrous Gorgon, a Medusa, turns mortals to stone. To our minds, Admetus' hesitation to touch or look may recall the myth of Orpheus and his wife Eurydice. So the, the earliest full iteration of their story and text occurs roughly 75 years after Eurydice' play. Elsewhere and later, we are told that Orpheus sinks his way into Hades and brings his wife Eurydice back up from the land of the dead. But Orpheus is given one rule. He must not gaze upon the face of Eurydice until they are out of the underworld. Tragically, Orpheus breaks the rule. He turns around and looks, and she remains in Hades. Here in Euripides' play, speech, sight, and touch are taboo senses that Admetus has difficulty expressing towards the likeness of his wife. At the end of the play, Admetus slowly realizes the woman Heracles has brought back is in fact his beloved wife. Admetus embraces her and grasps her face in his hands, and she is, um, but she stands silent and motionless. He can hardly believe his eyes. Admetus asks Heracles if instead he has brought back a spirit or a phantom. Heracles explains that Alcestis will not be able to speak for three days as she adjusts to back to the realm of the living. At this point, as Admetus realizes his wife lives, we see Alcestis at her stoniest. Sculpture is a medium that requires looking, the thing which Admetus fears. And while touch is possible, sculpture returns only a cold, rigid surface. As if Alcestis is a sculpture, she stands motionless and silent. Thus, as Alcestis is revived, she is the most like a statue. It is only at the end of this myth of transformation between living and dead, or stone and flesh, that we see the characters in the story most confined by the material qualities of their world. Before this, the stone likeness of Alcestis has remained only hypothetical in the narrative, just as her mortality has remained in flux. It's important to note also that the myth lacks a master craftsman. Heracles comes closest to this role as he ferries Alcestis between the realms of the living and the dead. Instead, the medium of text has allowed Euripides himself to play the role of master sculptor. With the other examples discussed here today, the materiality of the creations and the tactile qualities drive the plots forward. Here, however, Euripides sets the transformation into motion through words, a prophecy that someone must die. And over the course of his play, Euripides uses his own medium, text, to conjure stone from flesh and flesh from stone. The first century CE wall painting of Admetus and Alcestis from the so-called House of the Tragic Poet in Pompeii speaks to um, a sustained interest in the themes explored by Euripides in his 5th century BCE play. The same intersections of material and flesh, living and dead, animate and inanimate, famously manifest in Ovid's Metamorphoses. It seems likely that the poet Ovid had in mind Euripides' version of Alcestis, and particularly the main character's fluctuation between such states in his rendering of the myth of Pygmalion in Book 10. Ovid situates Pygmalion's story in a series of other myths that incorporate the themes addressed previously in my talk. Book 10 begins with the death of Eurydice and Orpheus's failed attempt to bring her back from Hades. 
Later in the same book, Ovid presents the myth of the Propoetides, the daughters of Propoetus, meaning the first poet. And the Propoetides reject Venus by profaning their own bodies. As retribution for their acts, Venus turns them to stone. It is because of these contemptible women that Pygmalion scorns living women and carves his ideal from snowy ivory. Through, um, through the piety he shows towards Venus, his sculptures come to life. So Ovid tells us, often he lifts his hands to the work to try whether it be flesh or ivory, nor yet does he confess it to be ivory. He kisses it and thinks his kisses are returned. He speaks to it, grasps it, and seems to feel his fingers sink into the limbs when he touches them. And then he fears lest he leave marks of bruises on them. And then later, she seemed to warm to his touch. The ivory grew soft. Um, and again he kissed her, and with his hands he also touched her breast. The ivory, sorry, the ivory grew soft to his touch and its hardness vanishing gave and yielded beneath his fingers as Hymetian wax grows soft under the sun and, molded by the thumb, is easily shaped to many forms and becomes usable through use itself. The lover stands amazed, rejoices still in doubt, fears he is mistaken, and tries his hopes again and yet again with his hand. Yes, it was real flesh. Materials are essential to Ovid's description of the animation of Pygmalion's statue, as the poet gives special care to the physical qualities of wax, ivory, warp, hardness, and softness. The scene of the unnamed statue coming to life preserves hints of the earlier myths concerning Hephaestus and Daedalus. Like Hephaestus, Pygmalion works with his hands, and even here, he first experiences the statue's living qualities through touch. The simile that describes her skin as soft as Hymetian wax that is melted and molded through sunlight and warm hands echoes the disastrous wings that Daedalus carved for Icarus. Ovid encourages his audience to draw parallels between his humble Pygmalion and the master craftsmen Hephaestus and Daedalus. In this same myth, we also find echoes of Pandora and Alcestis. Pygmalion adorns the statue he has carved, similarly to the way the gods adorn Pandora. He dresses it up with finery, put rings on her fingers, and then, as if fulfilling Admetus' wish of laying with a stone version of Alcestis, Pygmalion lays down his own statue in a fine bed. Beginning in the early modern period, European artists embraced Pygmalion as a paradigm for the successful artist. The myth became so popular that by the 18th century, this anonymous statue was finally given a name, Galatea, the Milky One. Um, modern visual representations often show Pygmalion sculpting Galatea from stone. This storyline of carving an ideal woman from a crude or unworked material is present even in the more recent plays, musicals, and movies that feature a makeover of a central female character. We might think of George Bernard Shaw's 1913 play Pygmalion, which is, was adapted as a musical and later produced as a musical film in the 1964 My Fair Lady, and even the 1990 film Pretty Woman. Despite these later adap adaptations, Pygmalion's statue in Ovid begins as raw ivory. The Latin word, ivor, occurs six times in the story. And ivory was an especially valuable material for sculpture in the ancient Mediterranean. Already in the second millennia BCE, artists were carving ivory from elephant and hippopotamus tusk. From Minoan palaces of Crete, we have found a number of fragments of small scale statues of human figures made of carefully carved ivory. A Minoan statuette dated to around 1400 BCE is one of our most complete and earliest examples. It was badly burned, which has turned the ivory to black in some places, but you can still get a sense of the craftsmanship that went into its creation. Great care has been given to the tenons and veins of the hands. The male figure wears jewelry around his waist and wrist, and his hair is carved of onyx. His eyes are made of rock crystal. 
The value of ivory persists in the historic period. Beginning in the 6th century, it is used in combination with gold and wood for large-scale images of gods in Greek sanctuaries. Ivory was used for small-scale statues, such as this Hellenistic Apollo from the Athena Nagara, and this ivory doll with gold jewelry from the 2nd century CE with movable limbs. Pliny, writing about natural history and natural materials in the 1st century CE, tells us that ivory was the most valuable material provided by animals who live on land, even above dairy, leather, or wool. Simply put, ivory sculptures were objects of wonder. In addition to the high value of ivory and the long-standing tradition of ivory sculpture in the Mediterranean, Pygmalion's choice of ivory is well suited to a statue that will come to life. Unlike marble or metal, ivory maintains the temperature of its environment and it grows warm to touch. It absorbs and retains heat more quickly. The coloring and delicate sheen of freshly carved ivory recall the surface of freshly oiled skin. Ivory is a pliable material, which is soft to carve and well suited to subtle anatomical details. The left hand from the Noan statuette, uh, which is only just a few centimeters long, um, is well, uh, illustrates how easily ivory lends itself to the tendon, tendons, veins, joints, and flesh of the human body. And I expect that Ovid had these material qualities of ivory in mind when ri writing his description of Pygmalion's statue coming to life. So picking up from where we left off, she seemed warm to his touch. The ivory grew soft, and its hardness vanishing gave and yielded beneath his fingers. Yes, it was real flesh. The veins were pulsing beneath his finger. Ovid places an emphasis on the hands of Pygmalion and the tactile qualities of the material, with the surfaces of ivory and flesh momentarily confused. As others have pointed out, Pygmalion uses touch to test the validity of his sculpture through the story of transformation. In a few short lines, the Latin verb temptare, to touch, uh, occurs four times. In particular, Alex Pervez has pointed out how Pygmalion's process of testing and knowing follows the process of questioning laid out by Stoic philosophers. To this, I would add that Pygmalion's process of hoping, testing, and knowing follows the transformation of Pygmalion's statue as she slowly changes from ivory to flesh. Because of the medium of text, we as the readers are also called to imagine internally a transformation of the statue that leads to our own sense of wonder within us. Our own minds, like softened wax, are molded in the hands of Ovid. So the myths presented here today existed in the rich and complex world of antiquity. Some of the stories were first shared verbally, others were first recorded in text. They existed alongside a visual culture, just as today we see videos or photographs alongside text in the news. Um, it is impossible for us to fully recontextualize these stories in the material world of antiquity. We ourselves are limited by our own ties to the present and our own incomplete knowledge of the realities of ancient statue production. Despite these barriers, the myths themselves allow us momentarily to imagine the sensory and emotional experiences of creating a living, moving, breathing statue. The texts surpass the limitations of time and the limitations of the physical world. And through this process, we ourselves dwell in the in-between. Thank you.